Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Libby Trosel, Senior Director of Corporate Services and Workforce Development with Advantage C, a service of Carroll Community College. And with us today as a co-moderator is um, Michelle Shepard. Good morning, everyone. And Michelle will be a co-moderator today for our Power Brew. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, as you are aware, if you've joined us before, the Power Brews are brought to you by Advantage C, a service of Carroll Community College. This is the college's area, which I refer to as E to B instead of B to B, education to business. We help area businesses um, increase the skill level of their employees. Uh, through training services, facilitation, consulting, and assessment services. So on your screen there, you will see um, an example of the services that we provide and have provided for clients in Carroll County for more than 25 years. We work with about 80 businesses a year, and in the past, um, uh, we have uh, worked with more than 50% of Carroll County's largest employers. So we're pretty proud of that. So um, you can see more information about Advantage C at www.advantage-c.com, including testimonials and case studies, which I think could be pretty valuable. One of the things I wanted to give a plug for this morning before we get started is we have a management development training program. These programs are open to the public and they're offered twice a year. There's 11 courses and it's a what I would um, confidently say a very well-rounded management development training program. We also develop this program uh, or, or, excuse me, deliver this program to employers at their place of business or here at the college on our campus. And um, we've really seen an increase in the number of people taking advantage of this program. So I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of the program. And for more information, you can visit um, our website at carolcc.edu. And if you're interested in bringing any of the program's um, classes to your place of business, you can just reach out to us at Advantage C. So for those of you who have joined us, this is just a little refresher here, uh, just a little overview of your control panel that you see there on the right-hand side. So the top arrow there um, on the right-hand side, the orangish, reddish arrow will con uh, collapse or expand your screen so you can see more or less of the uh, dashboard there. Um, we'd love to have these Power Brews to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions during the webinar. Uh, we'll get to all of the questions that we can during the webinar, and if we don't, we will get through to them after with email. Um, we also have another uh, webcam uh, pane there that you're able to kind of control where you see our presenter today, where you see her face. Um, so that pretty much sums that up. Okay, thank you, Michelle. And so um, a great segue to our presenter. So today's um, Power Brew webinar is going to be presented by Judy Morley. And so I had the um, pleasure of meeting Judy recently. Um, she is new to the area, moving to Gettysburg um, earlier this year. And she is the uh, executive director for the Carroll County Arts Council. And we're so fortunate to have a, her in our community. She's um, very uh, well regarded in the area of um, leadership and um, has a background in nonprofit leadership, community revitalization, and organizational development. She's the author of multiple books and articles, including Use the Comic 2x4 to Hit a Home Run and Five Steps for Coming, Overcoming Adversity, uh, which is today's topic. Um, and I would encourage you to uh, check her um, books out on Amazon.com. Um, Judy has been featured as a scholar in several documentary films, including Empower, Empowering Women in Business and Beyond. She serves on the faculty of the Lincoln Leadership Institute at Gettysburg. 
She's passionate about sharing her life in a way that will, her life lessons, excuse me, in a way that will benefit others. And uh, she holds a PhD in history, a master's degree in conscious leadership. And so we're very excited to have her today. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Judy. All right, thank you, Libby. So, good morning, everybody. We're gonna talk today about overcoming adversity, five steps to overcoming adversity. So I wanna start with this quote by Napoleon Hill. Every adversity, every failure, and every heartache carries with it the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. Now, Napoleon Hill was a gentleman uh, at the turn of the 20th century who was approached by the millionaire, multimillionaire, actually first billionaire in American history, Andrew Carnegie. And he told Napoleon Hill that uh, if Napoleon Hill would write a book on success, that Andrew Carnegie would provide him everything he needed to open the doors to interview people who had experienced success. So Napoleon Hill took him up on that and ended up having access to people like Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, the Wright brothers, John D. Rockefeller, and Franklin Roosevelt. And he wrote a book ultimately in the 1930s based on his 20 years of research called Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich, it's, the, it's been in continuous publication for over 80 years. And what he found is that adversity is a leadership strategy. People who never have a problem never know how good they can be. So we're gonna to talk today about overcoming adversity because certainly everybody experiences adversity and I think it's common for us to think that when we experience adversity, we've done something wrong. Why did this happen to me? Where what it really is, is it's the springboard to be a better leader and to experience more success. So leadership doesn't mean the absence of challenges. True leadership flourishes because of challenges. Adversity shows us our innate resilience, creativity, and leadership abilities. So that's basically what we're gonna talk about today. My own story is that I, um, 20 years ago, I had stage four lymphoma, as you saw in my bio, and it was in overcoming that, I had a 20% chance of survival. And um, 20 years later, here I am, so I succeeded in that. But what I found as I walked through this process of getting healthy again was that the steps that I followed to get healthy were very similar to people I talked to who were going through a divorce or having a business fail or losing their job and having to find a new career. And what I realized is that if you're going through a relationship issue, that's just really cancer of the relationship. And if you are having a business failure or an economic setback, that's really just cancer of the wallet. And that the system is the same regardless of what adversity we're facing. And it's by going through these steps to get to the other side of the adversity that we really experience how good we can be. So I have five steps that I'm gonna share with you guys today. So the first one, step one, is make peace with where you are. Now this sounds really simple, but I want you to know this is the hardest. This one can be the very hardest. Make peace with where you are. We all experience adversity. It is one of the most common denominators about the human condition. We experience situations we would rather not. Whether it's something extreme like cancer or a divorce or a bankruptcy, or whether it's something more simple like um, problems at work or temporary uh, tension in your family, we all experience adversity. And the best thing we can do is accept the situation. Because when we don't accept the situation, we put ourselves in this energy of resistance and we can't see anything except the problem. There's no way to get to solution from the energy of the problem. Einstein says you can't solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. So when we're focused on what's wrong, we can never get to the consciousness of what could be right. So the first thing we have to do is make peace with where we are. Now, like I said, that's the hardest. And we're gonna talk about that more in step two. But we have to make peace with where we are, accept the situation. And then we have to find a way to be grateful. That's like, are you kidding me, right? I mean, you know, when I uh, was diagnosed with cancer and some perky little life coach came and told me I had to find a way to be grateful, I was like, what? But it's all about what we focus on. 
me being upset about having cancer didn't make the cancer go away. It just it just delayed and postponed the wellness that I was trying to get to. Being upset about getting laid off of your job doesn't bring you a new job. It just delays your ability to get to where you want to be. Being upset at your spouse for cheating on you doesn't make that person not cheat on you. It just delays your own ability to deal with it effectively. So if you can stop focusing on the problem and look around at the things that are working in your life, what is working? What can you be grateful for? Are you healthy? Do you have great children? Are you in a job you love? Do you, are you in a relationship you love? What is working? Turn your focus from the adversity to the things that are working and find a way to be grateful for them. And that's the first step to making peace with where you are. So that's that's the foundation of everything else when it comes to overcoming adversity. And this takes a real leader. I was actually just reading last night a biography of Abraham Lincoln. And, you know, in the middle of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln lost a son. And yet he didn't wallow in his own grief. He got through it very quickly and found reasons to be grateful for his other two living sons and could get on with things. So make peace with where you are. Now, Michelle's going to put up a polling question right now. So go ahead and take this poll. Have you ever found yourself thinking like a victim for <laughs> days, weeks, months, or decades? And if you feel like, why does this always happen to me very frequently, um, consider how long you stay in that energy and go ahead and answer the question here. All right, so let's take a look at the results as they're coming in now. So 59% of you felt like a victim for days, 18% for weeks, 23% for months, not anybody so far for decades. That's great. That's good because certainly I know people who that is their defining characteristic is that they think like a victim. So. Thinking like a victim is one of those things we all do. It's very natural to feel like, why does this always happen to me? But we have got to get out of that way of thinking and take responsibility. Now, I'm a little hesitant sometimes to use this word responsibility because I think in many instances, especially when we're up against adversity, it feels like blame. Like we're blaming ourselves, I should have done something different. I like to think of the word responsibility as exactly what it says, the ability to respond, response, ability. And until we realize that we have the ability to respond, we can't stop thinking like a victim. We feel as if there are events beyond our control and some fickle universe is toying with us, some great you know, puppet master in the sky, some fate is playing the puppet strings with us and we are powerless and nothing could be further from the truth. True leaders know that they are never powerless. They always have the ability to respond, but we have to stop thinking that we don't. So if you were one of those in the, in the weeks and months category, then start letting go of that. Stop thinking about the situation and start thinking about solutions. I like to use the equation that's up there on the screen, E plus R equals O. What that stands for is event plus response equals outcome. Event plus response equals outcome. The event is just the event. Life happens, stuff happens. Things happen to us all the time, whether someone cutting us off in traffic, which is a pretty minor thing, or whether it's something huge like, you know, a diagnosis or getting laid off or something like that. It's just the event. But our response always factors into the outcome, always. So one response is that we can blame the event for days, weeks, months, or decades. 
And the more we blame the event and get stuck there, then that produces an outcome of being stuck and unable to move on. The more we can monitor our response and measure our response and decide on a response that's going to get us to the outcome we want, the better we demonstrate that we have taken responsibility. We have the ability to respond. In my situation, when I was diagnosed with lymphoma, that was just the event. And I spent a few days wallowing in some self-pity. Well, okay, maybe a few weeks wallowing in some self-pity. And then I realized that actually what I wanted was to live. I had a three-year-old daughter. I did not want her to grow up without me. And I didn't find a single book on cancer that said wallowing around feeling like a victim was how you get well. Everything I read said, get on with your life. Go do things. Act as if everything's going to turn out okay. And so that's how I decided to respond. And here I am 20 years later. I took responsibility. I also took responsibility for managing my own health care. I researched things on diet and exercise and holistic things and how they all interacted together. Whatever the adversity that someone is up against, we can figure out our own response R to get to the O or outcome that we want. So we have to take responsibility. But it all starts with realizing that we do indeed have the ability to respond, which by definition takes us out of being a victim. The next step, step three, Michelle's going to put up another polling question now. How many people know someone that's been laid off and at the time they think it is a complete disaster, but later they will look back and recognize that it was the best thing that ever happened to them? And I use the example of being laid off a job because I think it's something we can all relate to. We all know someone or, it's, or have been someone. So how many of you have either been that person or known someone who was laid off only to learn later that, or feel later that it was the best thing that ever happened? So 93%, so pretty, pretty much everyone can do this. Pretty much everyone can recognize that things that look like adversity actually turn out to be the best thing that happens. Now, step three then is identify the benefit that could be happening to you in this moment if you are up against adversity. So if you're in an adverse situation at work, if you run an organization and your business is failing, there's a benefit there. We just have to find it. Now, to get into a little bit of psychology, we all develop coping strategies as kids. We learn pretty early on how to manage our emotions so that we can get what we want. We learn that sometimes that crying gets us what we want, and maybe in other situations or other people in different families learn that crying is the quickest way to not get what you want. But we all develop these strategies. None of us are taught very well how to handle emotions. It's just not something that we learn. It's not something we're taught in school. It's generally not something our parents were comfortable with, and it's not something that our society teaches us. So what we learn is that as kids, we develop these emotional coping strategies to keep us safe and help us navigate the big grown-up world. By the time we're teenagers, we don't need those coping strategies anymore. Now we're grown-ups and we can, you know, operate in the grown-up world. But we don't always realize what those coping strategies are. And they become so habituated that we don't know that we have them and we don't know how to get rid of them. I think we all probably know someone who um, looks like a middle-aged man or woman but acts like a 10-year-old. And maybe we are those people at times. That is a case of an emotional coping strategy run amok. That's an emotional coping strategy that hasn't been dealt with. And I will tell you that the benefit of any adversity 100% of the time is to help us recognize these emotional coping strategies and then provide us with the path of least resistance to get rid of them. Now, that can look like a lot of different things. That can look like no longer settling for a job that is maybe not 
the job we really want and forcing us to take the risk to go out and get the better job, that would be speaking to the polling question we just took. That's the benefit of getting laid off. Many people who get laid off, that wasn't a good fit for them anyway. But they were playing small and living in this smaller job because of an old emotional coping strategy that made them afraid of taking the risk and doing something that was better for them, but that they were scared maybe they didn't deserve. And getting laid off forced them to deal with that emotional coping strategy and forced them to go out and get the better job, gave them the path of least resistance to do that. That's one benefit. In my example, um, with my health challenge, I had an emotional coping strategy of wanting to make everybody around me happy. So I was the mediator in my family of origin. I grew up pleasing everybody. And into my 20s, I still was pleasing my husband and my daughter and my friends and my parents and my siblings and everybody else. And I was exhausted. And when I had cancer, I had to realize I couldn't do that. And I had to start saying no which was devastating for me because it threatened my identity. Who am I if I don't please everyone? But I could see almost immediately that the benefit of that was that when I said no, guess what? Everybody just dealt with it. <laughs> the world didn't fall apart when I stopped taking care of everyone. Imagine. And so I was able to let that go and no longer needed that as part of my emotional makeup. And since then, in the last 20 years, I'm actually kind of the other way, I practice pretty good self-care and, and uh, don't run myself ragged pleasing others. So there's always a benefit to the adversity. There's always a benefit. The sooner we can look at it and find the benefit, the sooner we can do the first two steps, make peace with where we are, stop thinking like a victim and accept what's happened, and then go to step two and take responsibility and focus on the outcome we want and figure out how we're going to respond, the sooner we can see what the benefit of this is and embrace it rather than resist it. Let's go to the next step, step four. Now, Michelle's putting up another polling question for us here. How many of you believe that your thoughts create your emotions? Do you believe thoughts create emotions? Judy, while this poll was up, um, I'm just curious your thoughts on how much does one's natural emotional um, makeup affect the way that they um, think positively and take responsibility and cope emotionally like you're talking about? Well, there's that. Let's see. The short answer is I think that we all have a certain propensity, um, but I don't think that any of us are born with a certain emotional makeup. I think that on this one, there's a lot more nurture than nature. And I generally believe that it's everything is, is a combination of the two, but emotions are really just biochemicals that get released in our brain. That's all emotions are. There's tons of, of work on this. There's a great book called The Biology of Belief. Um, the, there's another one by Candace Pert that the name is escaping me, but I think it's all about the biology of emotions. And so our emotional makeup gets dictated by how we, how we cope with emotions as kids and then how our emotional biochemistry forms. And we create neural pathways and we create an, a biochemical inner world that then becomes our set point. Any of that can be undone. Any of that can be undone. Great, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so we'll, and, and obviously everybody out there agrees with me. Our thoughts create our emotions. 100% of people believe that. Our thoughts create our emotions. There's actually an author uh, named um, Joe Dispenza. He's, if you haven't heard of him, um, I suggest you look him up. He wrote a great book about five years ago. He's got lots of follow-ups to it called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. And he talks exactly about this. He talks about how our thoughts create our emotions, because when we have a thought, it releases a certain amount of biochemical juice into our system. And I think we all know this. When we have a fear thought, we release adrenaline and cortisol. Now, when we're really scared, back in our evolutionary days, if we're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, 
we would be afraid and adrenaline and cortisol would flood our systems and that would give us the fight or flight response and we could outrun the saber tooth tiger or be able to freeze and blend into our surroundings and let the saber tooth tiger go by or fight the saber tooth tiger and maybe be able to defeat it and survive. And then once the danger was over, all that adrenaline and all that cortisol drained out of our body and we came back to homeostasis. Well, whether you're being chased by a saber tooth tiger or whether you're thinking about going in and facing your boss with bad news, we have the exact same emotional response to the fear thought that's creating it. So that adrenaline and cortisol comes into our body again. The difference is that in the saber tooth tiger, tiger example, once the saber tooth tiger goes away, we return to homeostasis and we don't have to worry about it. In today's society, we think about our boss all day long and we go to lunch thinking, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Oh my God, he's going to fire me. Oh my God. And we go to sleep and we can't sleep about it. And what that has done is it creates a biological uh, atmosphere internally where our cells have receptor sites only for adrenaline and cortisol. And then like any addiction, when we don't have a fix of adrenaline and cortisol, our body goes through withdrawal. Again, lots of books on this. Best one I can recommend, Joe Dispenza, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. So we have to kick the habit of being afraid or being depressed or being sad or feeling like a victim. And to Michelle's question a little while ago, our internal emotional makeup is nothing more than the chronic thinking of the same thoughts that release the same emotional biochemicals that create our internal atmosphere. So our thoughts create our emotions. And the good thing is we can, we can change that. So if you believe that you were laid off of a job because you weren't good enough and gosh, I knew the boss was going to figure out that I was just faking it all along and nobody else is going to want to hire me and I'm probably going to be out of a job for a really long time and this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. You're going to feel bad <laughs> to say the least. But if you think, you know what, I didn't love this job anyway. And I think that probably this is just a great opportunity. And, and I've been looking for a graceful way out anyway. And, and this is really a good thing because now they gave me that graceful way out. And I know that I have skills that are really in demand. And I know that I do certain things well. And I'm just going to take an inventory of that. And I'm going to look in those areas so that I can find something that's in alignment with what I do really well. You're going to feel good. The difference in the external situation is, is negligible. You still got laid off and you still have to go find a job. But you're going to feel better about it. And once you feel better about it, you're going to be able to be more creative and take the lead in it, have more opportunities and see opportunities where you might not have noticed them before and come up with ideas that maybe you wouldn't have thought of because you're no longer thinking these self-defeating thoughts. This is also about practicing good emotional intelligence, EQ. I love emotional intelligence. I think that this is so valuable. Um, I'm actually a certified emotional intelligence trainer because I think it's so important. And again, study after study in the last 25 years has shown that emotional intelligence is a greater indicator of success than IQ. Over and over, we see that good emotional intelligence is the foundation of CEOs and middle managers so much more so than IQ. And, you know, Bill Gates famously dropped out of college to uh, start Microsoft. Not that he doesn't have high IQ, but what he developed was good EQ. Uh, again, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln had no formal education, but the man was incredibly emotionally intelligent. The four things that really make up good emotional intelligence are self-awareness and then self-management. So these two both deal with the self. You have to really understand how you're feeling and what you're thinking. And then step two is you have to manage it. Just because you're upset does not give you permission to grow up all over everybody else. 
So you have to manage it. First, you have to realize, gosh, maybe I'm feeling angry. Maybe I'm feeling a little down. Maybe I'm feeling a little too manic today. Maybe I'm feeling a little depressed. But then you have to manage it. You have to find a way to take care of yourself so that you can be a productive member of your team. You can be a productive leader. You can be a productive uh, spouse or friend or whatever it is that your responsibilities call you to that day. Those are the self pieces. And then EQ has two relational pieces the first is social awareness, social awareness. We've all had the experience where we walk into a room and we know something's happening, but we're not quite sure what. And we've walked into something and we pick up on the energy. That's social awareness. And then relationship management is having the, the skills to be sensitive and empathetic to what's happening. I um, had a situation at a job I worked at 30 years ago where um, my father, my father passed away. My father passed away on Christmas day. It was not a good thing, but he passed away on Christmas day. My boss was having a Christmas party on December, a holiday party on December 28th. And I was supposed to go. And I called her on the 26th and told her I would not be there because the 28th was the day of my father's funeral. And she said, well, you can still come. Just come by after the funeral. You'll probably need a glass of wine. That is not great social awareness, nor is it good relationship management, because there was no empathy of what I might be going through, only her wanting her staff at her party. So good EQ is crucial in leadership. And once we get there, then we can release some of our limiting beliefs about ourselves. When we can step back and look at things from a perspective of not only self and social awareness, but also self and relationship management, we can understand what other people need. We can kind of see ourselves as other people see us a little more. We can get outside of our own head and release these limiting beliefs we might have about ourselves and let it go already. Let it go. We are generally our own worst critics. And when we practice good emotional intelligence, we get to the point where we can just see things as they are without the filter of all of our own baggage over the years. I have a question for you, Judy. Yes. So um, thinking about these uh, limiting beliefs, do you think it's possible or why do you think it might happen that people may have a different um, perspective uh, between their personal life and their work life. It, do you understand what I'm trying to ask? I was just going to say, say a little more about that. Okay, so um, let's say someone at work might be a little more less likely to let go of limiting beliefs, but in their personal life, they're like always seeing the possibilities. So I think that are you asking what the reason is for that? Well, yeah, what, what you think the reason is might be. I think the reason is, is very much situational because when we are in our personal lives, we know a whole lot more about our personal life than anybody else does. We know a whole lot more about ourselves. I think at work, we um, can sometimes step out of that personal paradigm and look at things a little more easily through the context of the responsibilities that we're tasked with. You know, we look at ourselves through the lens of the job description. And I also think there's a belief that, you know, gosh, even if I am a complete screw up in every other aspect of my life with relationships or my kids or whatever, I'm still a pretty darn good project manager. So I think that because work is one compartment of our life, we can compartmentalize ourselves a little easier where our personal life, of course, is everything and work is a subset of that. So it's harder to release those beliefs because they touch everything. Um, I know that personally, and I, I bet I'm not alone, I've had the sense that uh, when I, in the past when I'm doing really well at work, boy, do I sure have them fooled. If they really knew how I am at home with my kids, maybe they wouldn't think so highly of me. And I think that that's a fairly common 
a fairly common thing, or maybe, you know, God, I'm a really great mom. Why is it that my staff doesn't understand how good I am at this? <laughs> I think that it's easy to compartmentalize our life, but when we're talking about our overall life, we see it in aggregate, and it's a little harder to get rid of those foundational beliefs. Makes sense. Thanks. Sure. I also had a quick question as well. So going back to the story about your boss and how she wanted you to come to the party after your father had passed away and it was his service. Are there ways for people like her to learn empathy even though she doesn't naturally have it? Yeah, yeah the cool thing about emotional intelligence that I love is that while IQ is, is a trait, we have, we have the IQ we have, and that's just been, just shown, been shown you can test people throughout their lives, their lives. Our IQ really changes. They'll test, They'll test differently because, because as we get older, our brains get more cluttered, we can't access, access the information, but, but IQ, IQ doesn't change. change. But, but EQ, EQ is, is a skill. It is a it skill we can learn. And, and yes, yes, there, there are, are emotional intelligence classes. classes. There, are there are all sorts of ways that you yeah. can um, develop, develop strategies, strategies for this. And, and it's, it's things that we all, we all kind of know. know. You know, you know we kind of know that you're supposed, supposed to be polite. polite. We kind of know that you're supposed to make eye contact when you talk to people. We kind of know that you're supposed to listen more than you talk. We all kind of know that. We just don't do it. So focusing in on those and practicing those skills can be learned. Yeah. All right. All right the, the last, last step, step here. The last, the last step, step is, is take inspired, inspired action. action. Take inspired action. I, 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 call, I call it inspired, inspired action, action because, because I think that. that what we really want here is we don't want to just act for the sake of doing whatever, whatever. We want to take inspired action because we want to go with the goal. In order to be a really great leader and to get the real meat out of the adversity we're facing, we have to redefine where we're going. That's the great gift of all adversity is it generally is a course correction. It shows us that what we thought we wanted or where we thought we were going may not have been the right course and we can readjust. So the first thing is decide what we really want. I just took over as the executive director of the Carroll County Arts Council, and, and um, I've heard a great story. You know, the Carroll County Arts Council, I can't believe there's anybody here who doesn't know this, but in case there is, in the spring we have an event called the Peep Show. And uh, it's an art um, exhibit where decorators make art out of the marshmallow candy peeps. And in the first couple of years that we had it, the Carroll County, County Arts Council made their own PEEP merchandise, so we used PEEP logos on things. Well, we were then discovered by the company that makes PEEPs, the Just Born Company. Um, we were using their logo without permission, and we were asked to stop. That looked like this huge adversity. It meant losing a lot of revenue. It, it meant not, no longer being able to sell goods. And the good thing that came out of it is that the Arts Council is able to decide what they really wanted. And what they really wanted is this is a fundraiser. So what they really wanted was to be able to maximize the income that they brought in. So they worked out an agreement with the Just Born Company. And now we're a licensee and we can use their logo and sell their merchandise on their behalf. It expanded the amount of merchandise we can sell. It expanded the ability to raise funds. And by taking that inspired action and getting clear on what the real purpose was, it wasn't just to give people something to buy. The real purpose was this is our biggest fundraiser. So in order to take inspired action, we have to use the adversity to decide what it is we really want. Stop, take a step back, say, did this happen because maybe I was going for something that I didn't really want? And the thing I've learned in being in the field of human potential for the last 20 years is when we hit adversity, it is almost always because we are going for a goal that is too small for us, almost always. Maybe not 100% of the time, but almost always we are going for a goal that is too small because we're scared of the bigger goal. So in step five, we have to decide what we really want. What is the what that we're going for? And I'll just say to you guys that if it doesn't take your breath away, it's probably too small. Because what we really want is huge. And if you are leaders at any level, it's because you are here to do something so much bigger than what's been done before. 
So before you can take inspired action, you have to decide what you really want and make sure it's big enough for you. I think that a lot of us spend our time asking, are we worthy of the goal? Let's make sure the goal is worthy of us. And then the second thing is be rigid with the what. Be rigid with the what. Jeff Bezos of Amazon says, be rigid with what you want and flexible on how you get there. Be rigid with the what. Now be flexible on how you get there. That's the inspired action. Once you know the what and you aren't moving from it, then you will start to see your creativity soar and the action will be inspired. You'll come up with creative ways that you couldn't have dreamed of before you decided on what you really wanted. Last November, Thanksgiving, I was living in Denver, Colorado, and I didn't think I would ever leave Colorado. I thought I would die there. My will still says that my ashes will be spread on Buffalo Bill's grave in Golden, Colorado. But I knew what I wanted. And I had come up with a new big goal. Jim Collins in Good to Great calls it a big, hairy, audacious goal. I had come up with a big, hairy, audacious goal. And slowly but surely, things started to open up. I was offered a position on the faculty of the Lincoln Leadership Institute in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, of all places. When I came out to speak with them, I met a friend for dinner in a town I'd never heard of before called Westminster, Maryland. And I parked in front of this cool old Art Deco theater. And because I love old buildings, I looked in the window and Googled it that night from the hotel room and found that they were looking for a new executive director. And so I sent them a, uh, a resume. I all of a sudden sold my home like in 21 hours for $10,000 over the asking price and needed a place to live, found a place. And by Easter, I had two jobs and was living in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I was rigid on the what, but so flexible on the how. If you'd asked me, I would have said I was just going to find a job in Denver, Colorado and live in the home where I'd raise my daughter and be there forever. But once I got rigid on the what, the inspired action started coming and it just we just followed the next right step and the next right step and the next right step. And before you knew it, boom, I had to get a new goal because I'd done everything I said I was going to do in November. So take inspired action. That's the lesson of adversity. So to recap, there are five steps to overcoming adversity. And adversity is something that you have to be comfortable with if you're going to be in any sort of leadership role. Because leading is defined by navigating people and organizations through challenges. So first, you have got to make peace with where you are. You've got to make peace with where you are. Second, take responsibility. Know that you have the ability to respond. Stop thinking like a victim. Choose your response to the event so that you get a good outcome. Third, identify the benefit that this adversity is going to bring you. Let go of your own old emotional coping strategies. Realize that you are now an adult and a quite capable adult and you can handle this. Let go of whatever limiting beliefs you might have about yourself or about the situation and then take the inspired action that you need to get to that outcome that you want. So those are the five steps to overcoming adversity. Booker T. Washington, the great African-American leader who um, was able to find at a time of great segregation, he was able to find a way for African-Americans to be accepted in the North. He was the first African-American to be invited by the president of the United States to dine at the White House. And uh, he said, success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome. Truer words were never spoken. So, that is it. So now I believe I will take some questions or comments. Yes, we do have a couple uh, questions from the audience. And I just have to say, I am feeling inspired. Um, that was great, Judy. Um, so the first question is, what are good ways in the moment to manage yourself from perhaps a damaging outburst or not speaking up? Great question. Great question. The best one 
is breathe. Let's, you know what? Let's practice. As ridiculous as this sounds, I want, we do not consciously breathe. I want everyone to take a big, deep breath all the way into your belly. Breathe all the way into your belly. Just. If you get good at practicing that, that will be the first part of stopping whatever emotional um, swirl is happening. There's actually a biochemical response to that. When we have the thought that releases the biochemicals, whether they're adrenaline and cortisol, whether they're serotonin, whether they're whatever the, the biochemicals are, oxytocin is another one that happens when we're emotionally charged, whatever those are, a deep breath of oxygen will oxygenate the cells and slow down their process to the receptor sites. So take the deep breath. So that's one way in the moment is to take a deep breath. Another good way I like to call projection. Projection gets kind of a bad rap in, in psych psychology circles. It's used to mean that, um, you know, someone else is projecting their own anger onto you or their own feelings onto you. But I want us to take that same phenomenon and use it for good. Stop for just a split second and imagine how you would feel if you said what you're about to say to someone or if someone else said what you're about to say to you. So put yourself in their shoes. And so if you're about to have a damaging outburst, just stop really quick and imagine that that person's about to say that back to you. How would you feel? And if you feel like, hey, yeah, that would be okay. Ask yourself a second time. And if you still think it would be okay, then take another deep breath and calmly, being very conscious of your tone of voice, go ahead. And if not, just stay quiet. One other thing, last thing, communication. Only 7% of what people hear is the actual content of what we say. 35% is our tone of voice. And I'm sorry, 38% is our tone of voice. And 55% is our body language. So if you can memorize that and practice that, keep that in mind. If you have a dog, you know this. It doesn't matter what you say. As long as you have the cute little dog voice, they will come to you even if you're telling them they're a bad boy. So keep that in mind and realize that when you are about to say something, if you can modulate your tone of voice, be conscious of your facial expression, the content will be softened automatically. That is great info, for, true for sure. Um, so the last question that we have, unless we get some more while you're answering this one, um, sort of piggybacks the last question we ha that we just had, but what are some quick reminders to practice these five steps for long-term success? So I know people are probably leaving this amped up and rejuvenated, and then you know maybe three weeks down the road, they kind of lose sight of the presentation. What, what are ways that they can, um, remind themselves long-term to, to follow these? This isn't a popular answer, but it's practice, 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 practice. You know, um, I like to use the example of someone who plays the piano. Uh, I, I play the piano, but I had to sit down and practice. So I could have read everything there is to know about the instrument of the piano. I could have read the history of piano music from Bach through Beethoven through Chopin. I could have done just about um, all of the study of how musical notes interplay and how the various stanzas come together. I could read the music of every single concerto ever written. I could study jazz pianists and um, classical pianists and ragtime. But if I never sat down at the piano, I couldn't play. And so what these five steps are is they're the information. What I would suggest is write them on a three by five file card, put them, write them on a couple, put one up at your desk, put one up in your, on your mirror. Put, I, I get dry erase markers and I write things on my bathroom mirror. Um, my, my family teases me because they call it the affirmation of the week because I'll have my blue and my red dry erase marker on my bathroom mirror. So I read it every morning. I have a three by five file card covering, I don't recommend this by the way, covering the speedometer of my car. <laughs> Don't do that and then get a speeding ticket and come back and sue me or something. But you know, if you want to put it up on your dashboard somewhere, put it up in your office, put it up in your kitchen if you cook a lot, put it up you know, on your tool bench if you're outside 
um, in your garage a lot. And just stop periodically and reread it and practice. And then what you'll notice as you practice these things, you'll start seeing them at work. You'll start having a situation and you'll you'll maybe want to fall into thinking like a victim. Something bad will happen and you'll be like, oh, I can't believe this is happening to me again. And you'll catch yourself quicker. And then the second piece of that is once you've practiced, praise every little baby step you make forward. So instead of going, why am I still falling into victim mode? Go, wow, I got out of that in 10 minutes and where it would have been two days last time. Good for me, because that'll reinforce those neural networks and create positive, good feeling biochemistry that then you'll automatically associate with these steps. And the more you have the good feeling biochemistry that you'll start to get addicted to, the easier it becomes to practice this. That's awesome. Thank you. Yep, practice does make, uh, make, make the difference there. I'm going to buy my markers for my mirror today. <laughs> Um, so I think that uh, finishes up with questions. Uh, we ended just a little bit early today. Um, we hope everybody is um, invigorated by today's presentation, and we thank you, Judy, for coming today. Lots and lots of good information. Um, so we will announce our uh, indestructible leadership uh, seminar that we're having in October. It's October 3rd from 8 to 10.30. It's right here at the college. Uh, you can register online. There's a link there on your screen. It's carolcc.edu backslash instant enrollment. We're going to have Mike Mannion here with us. He's going to be talking about um, indestructible uh, thinking strategies. So he will provide a, an action plan to increase your productivity and effective work habits at your workplace. Um, if you do have a group of people that you'd like to send uh, to the conference, please be sure to reach out to us at Advantage C. You can call us at 410-386-8095 or you can email us at info at advantage-c.com. So again, we thank you all for joining us today and stay tuned for the, our upcoming Power Brews. Thank you again, Judy.